Hi everyone and welcome to week 10 of Computer Science 225. This week we're going to talk about combining commands up to do different things. This week I think is really going to like level up our ability to do interesting and complex and powerful things on the command line. We'll first look at how we sort of run one command after another. Then we'll talk about how to run commands one after another in sort of a conditional way where we'll say like, do this command, and if it worked, do this command too. Or do this command, and if it failed, do this command as well. Then we'll talk about input and output redirection. So the way this works is if we have a program that runs one of our commands or a program that we as programmers ourselves write, that runs, that produces a bunch of output, instead of just having the output go to the screen, we can have the output automatically sent to a file instead. That will allow us to do things like uh, take the output and put it into a file so that we can open it up in Vim and look at it. Or take the output of our program that we're writing, put it to a file, and that way we can check if it is right or not. Things like that. We'll also look at input redirection where we can take the input of a program and put it into a file instead. So that way, that way when we run the program, it'll automatically take its input from the file so we don't actually have to type it out into the program. Both of those things are really helpful for programming, uh, especially testing, like we'll see, we'll see some examples of that. Then today we'll talk about, I think, my single favorite Unix topic, which is pipes. Pipes provide a way where we can sort of link two programs together, where one program will take its output and send it to another program as the input. And then we can carry that on and take the output of that program and send it as the input to a third program. So we can link our programs together to do interesting and uh, effective things. One example of this that we'll look at is how do we search the output of a program? So some of the programs, the commands we've looked at so far, like the ps command, give us a whole bunch of output, right? ps-a gives us dozens or maybe even a hundred lines of output, one for each process that's running on our system. But uh, there's no way in the ps command to search specifically. So if we want to search the ps command for a specific process, like a process that we wrote, ps doesn't have a way to do that. It doesn't have a way to search for a specific process. So without pipes, we would basically just have to read through every line until we find what we're looking for. But the reason that ps doesn't have any kind of search feature is because of the existence of pipes in Unix. We already have a program that's perfectly good at searching, which is the grep program we looked at last week. What the pipes allow you to do is to take the output of the ps command, all those like hundreds of lines of input, or output, sorry, and pipe it into the input of the grep program. So grep will search the output of the ps program for us automatically. That's a super powerful sort of like design idea. The Unix system is really well designed and really modular. No program really needs to have a search function because you can just take its output and pipe it through grep. Grep can search the output of every program that we have, every command that exists, or every program that you write yourself. If you are writing your own script or your own program or whatever, you don't need to write a search feature for it because you can just take your program's output and send it to grep for searching. Likewise, you can use sed to search and replace. Um, we can use other commands that we've looked at to do different things as well. So uh, it's really sort of like a modular sort of building block approach to doing things. Um, there's no point of giving every program its own search uh, feature. Like I said, you can just use grep for that. This is different to the way that things work in a GUI program. If you have a GUI system and it has like a process list, a process manager thing, there's no way in a GUI system to like link up with another program that does searching. In a GUI system, you'd have to give like each GUI program all the features it needs, which lead to really complicated, uh, complex, <laughs> uh, hard to maintain, and hard to write software. The real benefit of the command line system is that each program can do just one thing really well, and they can be linked together to solve more complicated tasks. So that's where we're going to go. Today, we'll end up talking about pipes. But like I said, we have a few more simpler things to talk about first. The first of which is just how do you do sort of multiple commands one after the other? 
that can be done with the um, uh, uh, semicolon character. So if I want to do an ls followed by a pwd, followed by like a cd into project one, I could do it like that. This says do the first command ls, then do the second command pwd. So you can see this is the ls command, this is the pwd command, and then cd into project one. So we cd'd into project one. We can, instead of typing the commands one by one like this, we can type them all in one command line, except separating them with semicolons. One thing that I'll sometimes use this for is if I want to make a directory and then go into the directory, which I almost you almost, almost always want to do. So if I make a directory called, I don't know, lab1, and then I also want to cd into lab1, you can just do that in one command with the semicolon. So make the directory and then go into it. That's a way that you can sort of link up commands so that they both will execute one after the other like this. There's another way that we can do this. Let me hop back up and get rid of this directory. Another way that we can do this is to run a command and then only do it, only do the second command if the first one worked or if the first one failed. So the way that this works is every command actually gives you a sort of status result of whether the program that you just ran worked or didn't work. You can check this with the special environment variable, which is dollar question mark. Dollar question mark is the result of the most recently run command, which in this case is ls. So when ls runs, it has a status or uh, a result, uh, which is an integer, which tells you whether this command worked or not. And if you list out dollar question mark, it prints out the value of this integer variable. Here it's zero. Zero means success, which is maybe a little bit confusing because in some programming languages, one is used to mean like true or success or yes, and zero is mean, used to mean false or no or, or uh, failure or something like that. But here in the Unix command line, zero means success, and anything besides zero means failure. So if we do a command that just doesn't work, like if I say to copy thing.txt like this, there is no thing.txt in this directory. So this command will fail, and it'll give me this little error message. And I can also check the dollar question mark variable and see that it's equal to 1. 1 means fail. Really, anything other than 0 means a failure. Some programs will have like different numbers for different types of errors, but 0 is success, and everything else is fail, is all you usually need to, to sort of remember. Now, this number comes from inside of the program itself. It sort of returns this number back to the shell. The way that this is done is uh, in C and C++, the main function in those programming languages always returns an integer. And that's because C and C++ and Unix are sort of intimately linked. They were developed together, really. And so the return value from main of a program written in C or C++ becomes the status code. In Java, I think the system.exit method takes an integer as well. And so if you call system.exit in a Java program, the integer you pass will be used for this right here. If you just return from main normally in a Java program, because Java has a void main, I'm pretty sure it will just give you zero if you just sort of return from main naturally. If you system.exit before the end of the program, like if you have an error, uh, situation, then you should return really anything other than zero to indicate that it was an error. So this uh, special number, this status code, indicates what happened with the last command. And the way that this is most often used isn't necessarily by checking it directly like this, but instead by using another method for linking two programs together. So one thing we can do is rather than having a semicolon link two different pieces of a command, we can do it like this. This says do the ls command, which it did. It printed this out here. And the and and says if the previous command worked, aka it returned 0, then move on and do the second command as well. So now it printed out the high message right here. If the command previous to this didn't work, so if I say 
ls, and then I tell it to list something that doesn't exist. And then I again say echo high like this. Then it will, if you notice, it prints out the error message as doing part of the ls. And then if you see it didn't go on and do the second part of this command, it didn't echo high because the first part failed. So semicolon, if we say like semicolon, something like this, this will always go on and do the second part of the command no matter what. Whereas the ampersand ampersand says, do the first part of this command. And if it worked, go on and also do the second part of this command. One place I use this a lot is, let's go into this file, uh, directory that contains some Java code. If I try to compile this.java, I can do this with the Java C command. Java C star.java will compile all the Java files that are in this directory. That will either work or it won't work. So here it worked because there were no compiler errors. So what I can do is I can say compile all the star.java files and run the program like this. This is um, a simple like library management program thing that, that I've given as an assignment. And so it has all of these book titles and things that are printed out. And then it gives you sort of a main menu of what you can do with the program. So we said compile the code. And if it worked, also run the code by running the main method of it. So I can quit out of this with five. If there was an error in the program, so if I say, yeah, I don't know, uh, hi, that would not be legal Java code to just have a random hi in your uh, source file. Now if I say Java C star.java and also run Java main, then it's going to compile the code. And when it sees that there was an error, it won't carry on and do the rest of this. Because if I just do the Java C part again, if we check the error code, it was one. So Java C star.java and and java main says compile the program and if it worked also run the program which is super helpful um, this uh, i'll do this command a lot to to sort of as i'm working on a program and testing it compile it and if it worked also run it um, with the semicolon it would run it either way which would be maybe confusing because you'd think that you were testing code that in fact wasn't actually compiling so that's the ampersand ampersand remember that the single ampersand is used for running things in the background, like we talked about when we did processes. The double ampersand is what we're doing here. This means run the second part of the command if the first part succeeded. A similar thing is the or bar or bar. Um, so if I say something like this, like ls or echo hi, like this, this is the opposite way. The or or, vertical bar, vertical bar, says run this first command. And if it fails, then do the second part of this here. So here, the ls worked, and so it didn't print the echo high. If I say ls something that doesn't exist or echo high, then it will run the ls command. And when it sees that it returned a bad error code, a non-zero uh, uh, status code, then it will do the second part of this command and print the high message as well. So this is the opposite of the ampersand ampersand. If we wanted to do it with our compiling example, we might say something like fix your code, or something like that. And now you can see that when the Java compile uh, command right here fails, then it goes and says this fix your code part. And so we did get this message here. If I fix the compiler error like that and try it again, it should now not give me the fix your code message. This one I don't find myself using as often as the um, ampersand ampersand, but one place that I will use it especially is in shell scripts. So when we get to that, we'll see that shell scripts are programs that consist of Unix commands, sort of one after the other, that are run together as a program, essentially. And so in that, I might have something like this, like copy thing into other thing, something like that, where we're doing a part of the shell script where we're like maybe copying a file someplace. And then let's say that the rest of the program, the rest of the shell script, won't make sense to do if this fails. So if we couldn't copy the file uh, in our shell script, then that would mean that we should 
quit out of the program. You can do that with the or bar with something like this and say copy thing to other thing. And if that doesn't work, then exit out of the shell script with the status code of one because this script now therefore it doesn't work. And so what this will do is it'll try to copy the thing. If it works, it'll just move on to the next line of code. If it doesn't work, it'll bail out of the script exiting out of it. So that's, that's a helpful way you can use the or bar or bar. But like I said, the uh, and one I find myself using more for situations like this where we want to compile and then also run the program. All right. So next, let's talk about output redirection. So in this program right here, we have this program that prints a lot of output. One thing we can do is instead of having the output print to the screen like this, we might want to put it into a file instead. So let's say we want to go through and search to see if this text is actually what we're expecting or not. We can do that by piping, or rather by directing it into a file instead with something like this. Oops, output.txt. And then I'm running the program, and so it's expecting input still, so I'll put five to exit. So the way that this works is that instead of having the output of this program, Java main, go to the screen like it usually does like this. Instead, with the greater than sign, we're saying send this into the file output.txt instead. The greater than sign is used for this. And if you look at it, it sort of looks like it's a direction thing, right? So like the stuff from here is going into output.txt. This could be the name of any file. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be output.txt. It can be whatever you want. Then if we open that file up, you'll see that this is where the output of our program went to. So then we can sort of go through this file in Vim and look at it and make sure it's right or whatever we want it to do. One thing you'll see is that the prompts <laughs> that, we put, that we print out also go into this file. So the what would you like to do and stuff like that goes here as well. So that's output redirection. There's uh, a few other things we can do, but let me first make an error in this file. I'll open up library.java and then change something in here so that we get a crash in this as well. Let's do this. Let's take out the code that initializes, oops, these array lists, that will certainly cause a null pointer exception. So I'm going to compile this again doing this so that I can show you something else about output redirection. And now if we run the program, again, redirecting the output to output.txt, we'll see that we actually don't get all of the output going into output.txt. Let me see if any made it in. One thing made it in. I guess the first book printed OK. But the error message that we get, this um, backtrace we get because of this null pointer exception, actually did still go to the screen. It didn't get redirected into the file. And that's because there's actually two output streams when we're running programs like this. Um, on Unix, but really sort of almost universally, this is the way that program output works. There's an output stream for regular output, and there's also an error message stream for error messages. And Usually, they both go to the screen, so you don't really see them as different things, but they're actually sort of different streams of text. So here, we said send the output to output.txt, which did work, and that went here. But the error message didn't get redirected. That is still going to the screen like this. So that is uh, an interesting thing. That's um, sort of helpful in a way, because if we get an actual error, we might want to see it like this. We don't necessarily want that to go to the same place. We can, though, actually redirect that as well with this to greater than. Um, historically, in Unix, um, there's sort of like numbers, integers associated with different files. And 0 is the input file for a program. 1 is the output, and 2 is the error file. So we can explicitly, this, we could also write like this, like this, 1 for the, for the output. But um, 2 explicitly is for the error redirection. And so I can put the errors into a separate file like this. Now output.txt still has this, and error.txt now has our error message printed into this. So the output goes 
one place with either just greater than sign by itself, the default is output, or explicitly with one to redirect output. Or we can do two greater than sign for the output of the standard error uh, text. By default, if you have exceptions like this in Java, they'll be, they'll be sent to standard error. In your own programs, you can write to standard out or to standard error, and so you can differentiate this yourself. In C and C++, um, there's a standard out file and also a standard error file, S-T-D-E-R-R. In Java, uh, you have system.out.println, which is the sort of normal way of doing print statements in Java. But you can also do system.error.println system.err.println will send to this error message output stream instead of sort of the standard one. Another example of redirecting the output stream, or rather the error stream, is if we want to search for something that's in the root of a file system. We didn't do this when we talked about searching with find last week. But in addition to sort of searching in our home directory here, we can search in the root of the file system. This is every now and then something you'll need to do. Like if you're programming in C and C++, there's different um, header files that you can import into your code. And sometimes you have to get the paths of them kind of right. So let's say, oops, we want to find a header file starting in the root of the file directory called, um, let's search for ncurses.h. This is a file that lets you sort of, in your C and C++ programs, do like fancier output formatting, like um, uh, move the cursor around and clear the screen and stuff like that. So let's say we search for this header file. If we do this, we get a lot of output. And almost all of it is these permission denied messages because we are not allowed to search in lots of directories. Lots of directories are not readable for our standard user, and so we have just hundreds and hundreds of lines of um, places that we were not allowed to search for this thing in. Um, and we did actually get the right out output down here at the very end. But uh, is there any more besides these two in here? Um, it, if they weren't happening to be right at the end, it would have been really hard to find these. And so we can say to the find command, run the find command, but don't print all of the error messages onto the screen. We can direct them into a file. So let's direct them into error.txt. And then when we do that, we get just the two outputs of where there is actually a file called ncurses.h. So um, that is the thing we can do. This is such a common thing, wanting to sort of run a command but ignore the error messages, that there's actually a sort of a different way of doing this. Instead of redirecting the error messages into a text file like this, we can redirect them into a special file called slash dev slash null. Slash dev slash null is sort of a special file. It works like a file, and you can use it like a file in some senses, except it's sort of like a black hole. Anything that you write to dev null just gets uh, erase. It just uh, is never saved to anything. So it's sort of a special file that when you try to save to stuff, it just literally deletes it. So if you don't care about the output of a program or the errors of a program, you can redirect them to dev null like this. So that is this um, output redirection thing. Something else that uh, I should talk about with it, though, let me go into bin where I have this program.py. This is one of the programs we've been playing with. It just asks, what is your name? You type it in, and then it prints out hello to it. Um, output redirection sometimes looks a little bit screwy with prompts that you print out to your, to your program. So if I do the output of this program to, let's say, out.text, the prompt is part of the output. And so now it's not saying, what is your name, to me anyway, uh, directly onto the terminal. It's going into this output file. So if I just know to type it in, then uh, it will look like this. It will sort of end like this. And then if I count cat out, excuse me, out.txt, then unlike when I run it on the terminal, the enter didn't get put into the terminal stream. And so it says, what is your name? Hello, Ian, like this. Um, which is OK, but uh, the, the prompts will sort of go into the output stream as well uh, normally. Something else that I should talk about with this is that we can also 
or rather, if we if we do it like this, when you have a greater than sign like this as your output redirect, then it erases the file. So if out.txt already exists, and then we redirect into it with the greater than sign, it will erase that file and overwrite it with the new output of this program. If we want to, we can append instead, which is done with greater than, greater than. So I can say python3 program.py greater than, greater than into out.txt, and then it will just append them. Alice, Susan, like this. And now if we catch this out, we'll see that all of them got sort of appended line by line. So the single greater than sign erases the file and overwrites it with the output of a program. And the double greater than sign just adds on to the end of it, sort of new lines at the bottom. So that's output redirection. You can redirect either standard output, which is done like this normally, or like this if you want to append. And you can do the errors separately with the two. And you can either append the errors like this, or you can replace them like that. So um, the next thing that we'll talk about is input redirection. And for that, I think I have another program. Um, let's say program two, which is also written in Python. This program takes in some input. Oops. Python 3 stats.py. It takes in some input of some numbers, and then it will tell you how uh, many numbers you put in, what the sum of them is, and then what the average of them is. So if we say 10 numbers, and then we put like 4, 1, 9, 5, 8, 7, 6, 2, 7, 9, like this, it will tell you that there are 10 numbers. The sum is 58, and the average is 5.8. So as you're working on this program, you might want to test it lots of times. You might run it again and say, put in five numbers, 7, 2, 3, 9, 8, stuff like that. That is uh, very weird that I, again, <laughs> happened to get an average of 5.8. That was just happenstance. Um, so this is a little bit tedious to type in all these numbers over and over again. What you can do instead is do input redirection. And the way that this works is the opposite of output redirection. Instead of taking the output of a program and sending it to a file, now we're going to take the input and, uh, and put it into a file and then send the input into our program. So I can call it like, let's call it like test1.txt. And inside of here, I'll put some numbers. I'll put 10, 5, 9, 11. Uh, 4, 17, 2, 13, um, 40, and 2. This is 10 numbers, I believe. And these are all the numbers that they are. So this is like what we would type into our program. We just put it into a file instead. And then we can save and quit out of here. Now we can run our program like normal, except we'll do an input redirection like this will redirect from test1.txt. And now what's going to happen is it's going to not ask us for the input anymore. It's going to read them from this file instead. And so then it just gives us the output directly. It didn't ask us to type anything in. It read the 10 from the file first, and then read each of the numbers, and got the average sort of as it's going. We could make as many test files as we want like this. And if you look at our code, our code doesn't open a file. We're not opening test1.txt. We're still reading from the normal Python thing of doing input, which is supposed to read from the keyboard. But the redirection sort of like hijacks that. And it makes it so that we can write our code to just read from the keyboard like usual, except it's really going to come from a file instead. That's sort of the, the point of the input redirection thing. So we can do that. That is very helpful because now we can test our program a lot more quickly without having to type in all those numbers. We can combine this up with output redirection as well. And I can redirect the output to out1.txt. Now the nice thing about this is that I can then like change the program if I want to. Like let's say I want to, or let's say I replace this uh, with a while loop instead of a for loop. And we say something like this, like uh, 
i equals 0, while i is less than the num, do this and then say i plus equals 1. We've made some change to our program, and we want to see if it works the same way. Well, what I can do is I can read in the same test case, test1.txt, except now I'm going to put it into a different file, check.txt. Then I can test if this is the same. Is check.txt the same as out1.txt? And because diff, which we talked about last week, doesn't return anything, we can see that it is the same. There were no differences between out1.txt and check.txt. So you can sort of use this for testing your program automatically. You can put the test cases that you want to give it into different files. Then you can put the expected output into another file and then check if the output you got is equal to the output that you were expecting. This is a way that you can sort of like automatically test your code. If you're given a programming assignment and your instructor gave you like sample inputs and what the outputs should be, you can put those into files so that you can automatically check if your program is doing the right thing, if it's giving you the right output or not. Input redirection especially saves a lot of time if you have a program that takes a lot of input. So I, you would never in Unix really have to type a bunch of input into your program. You could always put it into a file like this to save having to type out these numbers exactly every time as you're testing. All right, next we're going to talk about, I think, my favorite Unix topic for sure that there is, which is pipes. Pipes are a super cool way of combining multiple programs, sort of like what we did with the semicolon and the ands and the ors, except it's also sort of related to what we did with changing the inputs and outputs of programs. So what a pipe does is it allows you to take the output of one program and send it into another program as its input. And you can do this as many times as you want. So as an example, this is what we talked about at the start of today. This ps-a command that lists out all of the processes running on the system gives you a whole bunch of output. But let's say we're looking for a specific program. Let's say um, I go into, uh, what was it, project one, this Java program. And let's say I just start this running in the background. Java main, oops, I forgot I have this uh, null pointer exception happening in here. Um, let me take that out real quick. Uh, that was in library.java. OK, then we'll compile this just so we can get it running again. And now I'll run it again in the background. So this thing's running in the background, but because it's in the background, we can CD out. It's waiting for input, so it says stopped, but the process is actually still running. So if I CD back to the home directory, clear the screen. Let's say I want to search for this process that was running. Uh, I can do ps-a. Then I can look through to see if there's any Java process running. By the way, um, there's another flag to ps, which is the dash f flag, which prints out a little bit more info. In particular, it prints out the full commands that you've typed. Instead of just Java, it'll say Java main to indicate like the actual thing we're running. So ps, like I said, has no way of searching. If you want to search for a specific thing, you'll have to like eyeball this and see what is happening. But we have this grep program that can be used for searching. And we didn't talk about this when we did grep, but, but if you don't give grep a file to search, it will search on its input. So if I just search for, let's say, hello, with no file, by default grep does this, which um, people have before done this where they just forget the file and they're like, hey, what's happening? It's like frozen. But what's happening is grep is actually searching the input that you give it on the command line. So if I type like, hi there, it won't print anything. If I type, um, what's up, it won't print anything. But if I say hello, it will match that because it's actually searching for the text hello. The, there's not much point in that, right? There's not much point in searching for text that you're literally typing in because like, you already know what you're typing. But the reason for that being the case is so that you can give grep its input from some other place. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the output of ps and we're going to send it into grep as its input. And that's done with this pipe character or the or bar. Um, it's, it's the or symbol in most programming languages like uh, Java and C and stuff like that. But in Unix, it's called a pipe. And what this does is it runs ps-af. 
and it runs grep. And it takes the output of psaf and it puts it into grep as its input. And so in this case, what it'll cause to happen is it'll let us search the output of ps. And so now it gives us, oh, I just typed hello, so it only matches um, our own grep program that we were doing right here. But uh, if we search for Java, then it will let us find this program that we had running previously. It lets us search for the process essentially by name. We can search for processes by other name too. We can search for SSH and see all of, oops, there's somebody got logged in. We can see all of the SSH programs that are running currently. We can search for Apache and see all the Apache processes. It's basically a way to search the list of processes, but it's not part of the ps command. It works in conjunction with this grep command. Something else we can do, um, if I clear the screen, this history command we looked at before, this prints all of your past commands out, the history of what you've been typing. Sometimes you will want to, maybe you did like a super cool command and you want to see what it was, um, you can search this as well. Again, history has no built-in way of doing searching. But what we can do is we can take history's output and pipe it into grep for, I don't know, Python 3. So we can see all our Python commands. Or we can search for Java C to see all of our Java C commands. We can search for Vim to see all of our Vim commands. You can search for anything within history with this pipe into grep trick. Um, super helpful. There's more different commands that are sort of like utility commands like this. Um, one thing that we can do is we can do a ps-a into this command called head. What head does is it prints out the first so many lines of text that it gets and discards the rest. So if you want to look at only the first few lines of output from something, you can do ps-a of head like this. Likewise, or actually I should say this first, you can also give it a number. So if we want to say five lines, you can do dash five. Dash one will just give you the first line. There's also tail. If you want to print the ending of uh, output of the, uh, the end of the output of a command, you can pipe it into tail, which will just give you sort of the last few lines. By default, it's 10. But you can get like the last one line of output by doing tail of dash one. Another example, um, there's this command sort, which takes its input and sorts it, which doesn't really do anything much to the um, uh, ps command because it sorts it by line, and it's already sort of in numerical order. It looks like it did put the heading down somewhere else, um, down here, <laughs> um, which is interesting. But um, let's say we want to get a list of just the processes that are running sorted in alphabetical order. That would be something that is not built into the ps command. But with the power of pipes, we can actually do this. So again, we want to have a list of just the processes running on this server sorted into alphabetical order. The first thing we would have to do is get just this column. So we want to get rid of the process ID the pseudo terminal, and the time that it is running on. To do that, we can use a very handy command called awk. Awk has some sort of gnarly syntax, but it lets us filter by columns instead of by lines. So this is column 1, this is column 2, this is column 3, and this is column 4. A lot of Unix output commands like ls-l and ps give you sort of column formatted output. I can print just column 4 with this code, which again is um, admittedly a bit gnarly. Awk is a very, very powerful command. It can do tons of different stuff. But here we just want to print the fourth column. So we take the output of ps, pipe it into an awk that says to print column four. When we do this, we'll get just the outputs, just the actual command names of it. And now let's say we want to sort those into alphabetical order. We can pipe that into sort. Now we have our commands that are running sorted into alphabetical order like this. Let's see, if you notice there's some duplicates here. Um, we have Apache 2 uh, multiple, multiple times. There's another program we can pipe this into, which is called Unique, U-N-I-Q. What this does is it gets rid of lines that are duplicated. Now when we run it, we have 
the processes, only the names, column four, um, put through unique so that we don't have any duplicates like this. If you notice, we still have this word command, which is not actually one of our commands. That's um, just the heading uh, right here, command. How can we get rid of that? Well, that can be done as well. If we want to get all of the lines except for the first one, we can use the tail command with dash n plus 1, I believe, should get rid of it. So tail can give you all but the first so many lines. There it goes. Uh, tail dash n plus 2 gives us all but the first two lines. And so we can use that as part of our thing as well. So let me put that in here. It would have to go here. Um, I guess it just has to go before the sort, really. Tail dash n plus 2 into sort. This is quite a complicated little bit of piping that we're building up. Now we've given ourselves, let me clear so you can see this easily. We say list all the processes, then print out only column four from that, then cut out the first line because that's just the table heading, then sort them, then get rid of the duplicate ones. So this is why it's called a pipe, because it forms a pipeline of data. We're taking some data here, lines of, lines of text. We're piping it through this command that only prints us column four. Then we're piping it through this that gets rid of the first line. Then we're piping it through this command, which sorts it into alphabetical order. Then we're piping it through this that gets rid of the duplicates. This is quite a complicated pipeline, but it sort of shows you the power of what you can do with these pipes. You can sort of drill down to get exactly the output that you want from these different programs. Another example is with PS, let's say, that we can pipe into that's helpful is this program wc-l, which I think I've made a cameo appearance in one of the recent videos. This prints how, however many lines of output we're given. So again, we can run it just on the command line like this, in which case, when we don't give it a file, it by default reads from the standard input. And so we can say, hello there, and it will tell me two. I gave it two lines of input. If I take the output of a program, though, and pipe it into wc-l, it will tell us how many lines of output we have. So ps-a produced 166 lines of output. This will let you sort of just count something like this. If you want to know how many files you have total on your system um, in, your, in your home directory, we can go to our home directory, and we can say find from here all of the files. And that prints out a whole bunch of stuff. How many do we, files do we have? Well, don't count them manually. Just pipe the output into wc-l. That will tell us we have 554 files in this, most of which are hidden files in relating to Git stuff, especially for my Vim setup. Um, so that is another usage of this wc-l. Another example, in one of my recent classes, I gave students the project of creating a game called Wordle, in which they take in, um, or rather, the, the game is sort of a puzzle game where the user has to guess a five-letter word, which is randomly chosen, and the program gives them certain feedback and stuff like that. But let's just say we want to get a list of all of the five-letter words there are in English. Well, Unix has a file containing a dictionary, basically just like a list of words which is for the purposes of spell checking programs. Um, where is it? I think it's in, uh, I think it's in user share dict slash words. Yeah, there's this file, user share dict words. Now, if we look at this file, it's got tons and tons of words, many of which are not five letters, of course. So let's say we want to get the five letter words only out of it. We can do that by piping the output into grep and searching for five-letter words. This requires a little bit of regular expression knowledge, which is going to be a bonus topic for this class. Um, but uh, we can do it like this. Five. In regular expressions, the caret means the beginning of the line, and the dollar means the end of the line. And so we want lines that start with the beginning of the line and then have five dots, five, word, uh, five single letters. A dot um, matches just one single letter followed by the end of the line. 
we do this, we should get all of the five letter words, which you can see all of these words now have only five letters. Some of them have things that aren't totally strictly OK in a word, like a weave with an apostrophe in it. So we want to get rid of the apostrophes. How can we do that? Well, we need to pipe it into another grep. And this is where the dash v comes in helpful that we talked about last time. I can do an inverse search for the apostrophe. This will give me everything that doesn't contain the apostrophe. And so now all of those words that have the apostrophes in them should be gone, just like that. What if we want to look at these words? We want to see them like this. Um, we want to like, be able to like, search through them and stuff. Well, we can pipe it into this program called Less. Less is a program. It's basically like the pager program that you can be in if you do a git status and it's too long to fit onto the screen. Or if you do a man page, you're in this sort of paging program that lets you sort of go through. Um, and so you can quit out of it with Q, but less lets you sort of like go through and search um, for things like this. Um, so if we want to just check out this output, we can do this. One thing you'll notice is that it has lots of words that begin with capital letters. We want to get rid of those as well. We don't want to have any capital letters in our word list because those are all proper nouns, which shouldn't be inside of our guessing game. We can also put in another pipe to filter out the capital letters, another grep-v. And here, our pattern is going to be a through z. Again, this is a little bit getting into regular expression stuff, but um, we can still talk about it. Then let's look at the output of this. We can again put it into a less program. And now we should see that all the capital letters are gone. So this looks like a pretty good start for our list of five letter words. Another thing we can do instead of piping into less, this command has gotten so long I've wrapped around to the other line of uh, the next line of, of my terminal. Instead of putting it into less, we can put it into this program view dash. And view dash, uh, actually, you can do it just like this, vim dash. And if you give vim the dash option, it says to read, instead of a text file, read the input of the program. And so that lets you open up the output of a program in vim, essentially. So if you want to like, check this out any further, you could do it inside of vim instead of less. Um, if you do it with vim like this, it'll say, hey, you haven't saved this file, and it'll like, force you to quit out like this. So instead, then you can use the program view, which is like read only vim. And so then that way, you can just quit out of it, and it won't bug you about it. So I often pipe into view dash like this so that I can like look at the file, look at the output of stuff of whatever we've gotten in vim, uh, and be able to like navigate and search and do search in place or whatever I feel like. So if we're happy with this, though, we're happy with all this stuff, then we can put it into our file. Let's put it into five letter words.txt. Now we should have this file, five letter words.txt, which we've built up out of a pipeline of things. This was built in sort of a complicated way. First, we started by printing out all of the words that exist. Then we put it through one grep to pull out only the five letter words. We put it through another a grep that filtered out the ones with apostrophes. We put in through another grip that filtered out the ones with capital letters. And then we redirected it into this file, five letter words.txt. So that was quite a more powerful example of the things that you can do with pipes. This would have been quite a lot more tedious if we did not have pipes. We would have had to either write a program to pull out those things ourselves, or I don't know, done something more complicated. But having the power of being able to like put in these different commands to like filter out and put in and sort and uh, sort of just like generally process the, the output as it's coming into your program is a super powerful way of doing things. I routinely do things with pipes that make me very, very happy that I have Unix skills because uh, things that you can do easily with pipes are like super hard without them. And so this is where I really feel that the command line uh, tools come in super, super valuable. So this week, we talked about a bunch of things. We talked about combining commands up, essentially, in multiple different ways. 
either just saying do this command then do this other command with a semicolon. We also talked about doing multiple commands but sort of conditionally, like do this command and if it worked, do this other command, or do this command but if it failed, do this other command instead, or in addition. Then we talked about file redirection, both taking the output of a program and sending it to a file, and taking a file and sending it as input into a program. Then we talked about pipes, which again are the best. You can use them to chain together different commands to sort of process the output as it's going along. This is an idea that has sort of been taken up into programming languages actually. Newer versions of Java have this idea of a pipeline where you can sort of like take data and pass it through multiple methods sort of like this. Uh, it exists in functional programming languages. It's a super popular idea in languages like Clojure and Haskell and stuff like that. Um, so this idea, I think, is really worth knowing and studying and thinking about, sort of independent of anything on the command line. So um, that is all for this week. I will see you next time. Bye.